Good evening and welcome to our Monday, Thursday and Good Friday combination service. I pray that God's blessings will be on you as we worship together. I do have a couple of announcements that I need to do before we um, actually get into our worship service. Remember that this evening in this worship service and then again on Sunday, uh, Easter Sunday, we will be partaking of the Sacrament of Holy Communion together. So if you need to put this on pause right now and go get your communion elements uh, that you are going to use during that portion of our service, feel free to do that now. On Sunday, we will have communion together. We are meeting together in our Rose Garden, the first time that we will have in-person worship again. Um, I'm excited as I can be to see you all, to see your faces, uh, and to worship with you together in our Rose Garden. Remember that we're going to do that at 1 o'clock on Sunday, Easter Sunday. So 1 o'clock in the afternoon, we will meet in our Rose Garden, and I want to remind you to bring your own chair, your own lawn chair, and a mask, because we do require masks. It does not matter if you've had your vaccines yet. Everyone is required to wear a mask when we are together. And of course, we need to make sure that we space our chairs out six feet for social distancing, unless you are in the same household, then you can sit together. But non-related uh, households need to be six feet apart. Okay, um, welcome to this time of worship. I hope that you will be blessed in it. Please join with me in our call to worship. Is it nothing to you, all you that pass by? Behold, and see if there is any sorrow like his sorrow. God commended his love toward us in that, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sins of the world. Our hymn is in your hymnal on page 288. And we will join together in singing, Were You There?
And will you join with me in the prayer of confession? Lord, we confess that we have sinned against you and our neighbor. We have walked in darkness rather than in light. We have named the name of Christ, but have not departed from iniquity. Have mercy upon us, we pray. For the sake of Jesus Christ, forgive us all our sins. Cleanse us by your Holy Spirit. Revive our consciences and enable us to forgive others that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your holy name. Amen. God even now forgives us and sets us free to live new lives in Jesus Christ our Lord. Going forth, we may live not in fear or dread, but secure in God's power and love. Nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. Therefore, let us rejoice in the Lord our God. Our scripture reading comes from the Gospel according to John, chapter 13, verses 1 through 35. Now before the festival of the Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world and to go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The devil had already put it in the heart of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray him. And during supper, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going to God, got up from the table, took off his outer robe, and tied a towel around himself. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the feet of the disciples and to wipe them with the towel that was tied around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? And Jesus answered, you do not know what I am doing, but later you will understand. Peter said to him, You will never wash my feet. And Jesus answered him, Unless I wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet, but only my hands and my head. And Jesus said to him, One who has bathed does not need to wash except for the feet, but is entirely clean. And you are clean, though not all of you. For he knew who was to betray him. For this reason he said, not all of you are clean. And after he washed their feet, and had put on his robe, and had returned to the table, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right for that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have set you an example that you also should do as I have done to you. Very truly I tell you, servants are not greater than their master, nor are messengers greater than the one who sent them. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. I am not speaking to all of you, but know whom I have chosen. For it is to fulfill the scripture, the one who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me. I tell you this now, before it occurs, so that when it does occur, you may believe that I am he. Very truly, I tell you, Whoever receives one whom I send receives me. Whoever receives me receives him who sent me. After saying this, Jesus was troubled in spirit and declared, Very truly I tell you, one of you will betray me. And the disciples looked at one another, uncertain of whom he was speaking. 
One of his disciples, the one whom Jesus loved, was reclining next to him. Simon Peter, therefore, motioned to him to ask Jesus of whom he was speaking. So, while reclining next to Jesus, he asked him, Lord, who is it? And Jesus answered, It is the one to whom I give this piece of bread when I have dipped it in the dish. So, when he had dipped the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas, son of Simon Iscariot. After Judas received the piece of bread, Satan entered into him. And Jesus said to him, Do quickly what you are going to do. Now, no one at the table knew why he said this to him. Some thought that because Judas had the common purse, Jesus was telling him, Buy what we need for the festival, or that he should give something to the poor. So after receiving the piece of bread, he immediately went out, and it was night. When he had gone out, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. If God has been glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself, and will glorify him at once. Little children, I am with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and as I said to the Jews, now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. In a former church office, there hung a beautiful needlepoint of the United Methodist Cross and Flame. It was a gift to the church from one of the parishioners, and this piece was not huge. It really fit into a five by seven frame, but I know the woman who did this needlepoint spent hours and hours weaving this beautiful tapestry together. It, it was a true work of art. Though I've never done needlepoint myself, I know that basically how it's done. You get the pattern or the outline and someone has to design that first and then you color it on the canvas so that the artist can see what color threads go where. And then that pattern is carefully followed stitch by stitch and it's really quite laborious work. It can even be a strain on the eyes, but as the work develops, there's a growing sense of excitement as the picture begins to come alive. And there's even a sense of a great anticipation of this completed work. And then finally it's framed, ready to be displayed as an object of beauty and interest or a sign of devotion and love. In our reading from John's Gospel this evening, Jesus speaks to us about giving us an example to follow. He says, I've given you an example. Just as I have done, you must also do. And the word Jesus uses, the one translated as the word example, could mean in the ancient world a picture showing how something was to be done. It's, it's a tracing that someone else should follow. It, and then they should fill in the details. So Jesus, having washed the disciples' feet, declares that he has established a pattern for the disciples. 
it, this is a pattern that they need to follow. It's a pattern of unconditional love and humble service. And as this pattern sets Jesus' followers on an extremely intensive task requiring such strain, not only on the eyes or on the fingers, but also it could be a strain on the nerves and on the will and on the heart and the soul, that we shouldn't be surprised that many of us fail to get it right. So why is this so hard? Why is it so difficult for us to follow this pattern of Jesus? Why does Jesus have to go on to insist that the slave is not greater than the master? That the person who is sent is not greater than the person who has sent them? It's hard because we are proud. We are above the demeaning tasks of a servant. We are too good to give someone a position higher than ourselves. And then we go even so far as to, to serve others. We have to do it so that others see just how humble we are, so that we can be proud, proud of being humble. <laughs> But the true thing is, a true Christian disciple follows the pattern that is created by Christ. And he, Christ creates that moment for us at the very moment that he wrapped a towel around his waist and stooped and washed the disciples' feet. There's really no place for pride in that kind of service. I don't think it would take any of us very long to think of the hundreds of ways that we have lifted ourselves above others, maybe even in the last few months. Even if it wasn't actual actions, we have thoughts all the time in which we compare ourselves to others. And most of the time we reason that we are the better party, don't we? And so, that's why we're worshiping tonight. We need to be washed again of our pride. This is why year after year, Christians around the world relive the Last Supper. You'll see that over here I've got the, um, the communion bread and the, the, the chalice, the cup that we will partake in communion together in just a moment. You know, also, most of the time in Monday Thursday, we talk about the washing of the disciples' feet. And we talk about that because we need to understand a good dose of humility. Because we need to remember what it feels like to truly serve one another. And we need to kneel down on achy knees and touch grimy, smelly feet and wash them until they are clean. That's what they did back in the day of Jesus. And I'll get to that in a moment. We have to admit that, you know, <clears throat> we're not so great ourselves. And to expose our nasty feet and to allow someone else to wash them until they are clean. That's uncomfortable. And when we follow the pattern that Christ has set for us, it strips away every ounce of pride and perhaps <clears throat> even some of our dignity as well. But the promise that Jesus makes to his disciples is this, since you know these things, you will be happy if you do them. And you see, it is here in this foot washing and, and around the Lord's Supper that follows that we're going to see the way to happiness, the way to the Father, the way that will be fully opened through the crucifixion and the resurrection. Indeed, tonight we will begin the long, slow build-up to the crucifixion 
a death that only Jesus, the sacrificial lamb, could die. But beyond the dark days of the crucifixion is Christ's resurrection. A resurrection that can be shared by any and all who dedicate themselves to following Christ's pattern. So on this night, Jesus is showing us a way to share in his ministry. <clears throat> and through that, ultimately, to share in this offer of eternal life. But if we truly desire to share in that Last Supper, that great heavenly banquet where all are gathered with Christ as our host, then we too have to be willing to humble ourselves before one another and just as Jesus did on this night so many years ago. This is the great importance of the foot washing. As Jesus ties that towel around his waist and kneels down to wash the feet of the disciples, he points to his actions and, and he calls it love. And this isn't just any love. This is supreme love. Wash one another just as I have washed you. Feed one another just as I have fed you. Serve one another, just as I have served you. Love one another, just as I have loved you. And at that moment when he might have been all puffed up with pride at the great accomplishments of his ministry, Jesus had great humility. But that's what love is, always. Love is never self-seeking. It's always humble. Love doesn't boast. It's not proud. Love never fails. This love, the love which Jesus showered upon his disciples on this night so long ago, is what makes the upper room such a meaningful place. And as we gather here this night, because we need to experience the kind of love that Christ shared with his disciples as they gathered for one last supper, we think about who was assembled there. It was quite the motley crew, actually. They all had very colorful backgrounds. They were not at a point where they fully believed all that Jesus had been telling them and their faith was still so fragile. They had been unable to cast out demons despite the fact that Christ had given them the authority to do so. <clears throat> they had argued over who was going to sit on the right and who was going to sit on the left of Jesus in his glory. And so sitting around the table there, was one who was going to deny Jesus and one who was going to betray him. And Jesus knew these things and he loved them anyway, all of them. He washed their feet despite the blackness of their souls. He offered them a meal where he gave them all of himself now, it doesn't matter what we have done or what we might yet do. We, too, are invited into Christ's presence. We are invited to sit down at the table and experience this fullness of Christ's love because it's, it's the table of the new covenant. But this covenant is a two-way street. It's both a give and a take. And the gathering of the Lord's Supper is the beginning of a new way for all who want to follow the way, Jesus Christ. And Jesus' words in the upper room and his betrayal and his death soon afterwards are intended to show us God's faithful ways and God's faithfulness to each of us. So what we received or receive are washed and what we received at the Lord's table 
are intended to strengthen our own faith, and in particular, our faithful service to God in Jesus Christ. <clears throat> our vocation as Christ's disciples both begins and ends at the table. The ministry begins when we come together as broken vessels and we partake of this new covenant of grace and forgiveness. And we come full of pride and selfishness and all of those nasty things that tarnish our relationship with Jesus Christ. And we allow ourselves to be forgiven. Ah, washed clean, made new in God's infinite love and grace. But the thing about the Lord's Supper is that it, it, it goes way beyond us. The new covenant was made on behalf of the whole world, and it is intended to gather all of creation together around the Lord's table. So the responsibility that we have as ones who share in the body of Christ is to rise up from this table and then to do as Christ does, to go out and to share the good news, to serve Christ, and to wash one another's feet. The pattern to which each of us is called to ministry is empowered by God. We go out to serve others, humbly inviting them to join us in the feast. Just as Christ himself did, we must long and and strive for the day when all of creation will gather around the Lord's table and share in his banquet of love. On that day, the darkness and sacrifice of Holy Thursday and Good Friday will find its fulfillment. And on that day, we will know true happiness. On that day, God will reign on earth as in heaven. Thanks be to God. Amen. I invite to this Holy Communion those who sincerely repent of their sins, who love their neighbors and are willing to live in a new kind of life under God's direction, I invite you. Expectantly, faithfully, receive this sacrament. Let us make an offering. We offer this bread, we offer this cup, in the name of Jesus our Lord. Let us give our lives to God. We do offer our lives to God. Together let us thank the Lord, for it is the least that we can do. Thanking God is the very least we can do, for now we can live all of life without fear. We can face even death without anxiety, for we know that whether we live or die, we belong to Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus went forth in God's name to save the world. We remember in this sacrament his life and his death. We call on him to live in us and with all people. We look forward to being with him forever. This, according to scripture, was his intention. Jesus wanted all people to receive these symbols of his love. At the dinner table on the very night he was betrayed, he told his disciples, I have wanted so much to eat this Passover meal with you before I suffer. Take, eat this bread. This is my body given for you. Drink this, all of you, for this is my blood poured out for you. Do this whenever you want in memory of me until I come again. Then Jesus and the disciples went out into the darkness of the Mount of Olives. We use these symbols of his body and blood in memory of his life and death and in the faith that he is risen to be with us 
and in the hope that we will be with him to the end of time. Let us pray that as we receive this sacrament, Jesus will become a living reality in our lives and in our life together. Let us pray together. We do not come to this table, O Lord, counting on our own goodness. For we know that we have missed the mark of our high calling. We trust only in your love. We rejoice that your love is so great that you invite us to come as guests. Grant that we may receive this sacrament as a turning point in our lives. May we grow to be like you as you become the center of our living. Amen. Please remember with me the words of our Lord on that night in the upper room as together they had a meal and as he shared that meal with his disciples. Please remember with me that Jesus took the bread and he broke it and he gave it to them and he said, take and eat this, all of you. This is my body broken for you for the forgiveness of your sins. And in a moment together, we will eat the bread and drink from the cup. But he, he then took the cup and he gave it to them. And he said, this is my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins, that you might have eternal life. He gave us the gift of eternal life. And we, we look at his spilt blood, we look at his broken body, and while it grieves us, deep down we are so grateful, so thankful that Jesus died to give us life. And he did that on Easter, I mean on uh, uh, Monday, Thursday, and then on Easter as he was crucified, or Good Friday, man, <laughs> on Good Friday as, as he was crucified, that he rose on Easter to show us that death is not the final answer. We have eternal life with him. And so I would invite each of you in your homes wherever you are, to take a piece of your bread, the body of Christ, and take your cup, the blood of Christ, and together now, let us commune. Let us pray. Oh God, we give you thanks for this great and wonderful gift of life. May everyone choose to accept that gift that you have freely given to each of us. Bless us now, O oh Lord, as we come and offer ourselves to you for your service, for your love, and accept that gift of eternal life. Amen. Let us join together in the prayer of thanksgiving and dedication. O oh Lord, please accept our offering of praise and thanksgiving. We thank you that in Jesus Christ we find forgiveness for all that is past and a new future of meaning and purpose. Here and now, Lord, we offer ourselves to you. We are yours body and soul. May we all find our lives filled with grace and goodness. Lead us to a new life together 
In Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now let us join together in the unison benediction. This service is ended, but our life in Jesus Christ, our Lord, goes on and on. We go now in his name into all the world. Let our light so shine and our joy be so obvious that all who see us will come to praise God. Amen.